Hello everyone, Derek Barefoot here on the Typologetics YouTube channel. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Leave your questions and comments. We've been considering uh, closely the gospel accounts of the resurrection appearances of Jesus, comparing them in some detail, uh, gleaning everything we can. We're going to continue with that tonight. Uh, let's open with prayer. Father, uh, please give us an understanding of what we uh, find in the scriptures and ability to bear witness in spirit and truth to your Son. Amen. I, well, uh, it's been a while, I think uh, more than a week, a week and a half even, uh, since uh, our last study. Uh, for those of you who um, may not know, May's mother, Gloria Mercano, passed away uh, be two weeks ago uh, tomorrow. And so naturally, that was that had an impact to our schedule here. Um, May also had to uh, had to work tonight at the hospital, so I'm here alone. I'm going to go ahead. May should be with me next time uh, for our next study. But we have been in uh, the fourth gospel, in John's gospel, comparing the accounts that we find, <clears throat> particularly in chapter 20. We'll be moving on to chapter 21 soon, but we're still in chapter 20. And comparing what we find in John with the synoptics, with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, trying to uh, draw some conclusions from that comparison. And just to review, um, sort of the big picture that we've been seeing is that uh, the women were the first to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's emphasized in Matthew and Luke where we find that the, the belief of the women is actually moved up to their tomb experience. It's like I said, it's, it's backdated to the tomb. The, the women uh, immediately believe in Matthew and Luke and go off to carry the news that they've heard of uh, Jesus' resurrection to the male disciples. On the other hand, in Mark and now in John, uh, we see that he, the women themselves actually did not believe immediately. So there's an even larger uh, lesson or point that we can learn, which is that all of the disciples, even though the women were the first to believe, the women and the men had to be persuaded over some time. Now, it wasn't a long time in the case of the women, but they were not quick to believe. They were, in the words of Luke, slow to believe that Jesus had actually ridden, uh, risen from the dead. And Jesus had to make several appearances in order to uh, overcome their hesitance to believe. It was like um, uh, a desire not to be given false hope or to be deceived in some way. And uh, uh, and it's just different, a different emphasis in our different Gospels on uh, the women, as I say, being the first to believe and yet also being somewhat hesitant to believe. For example, in the Gospel of Luke, we see the women when they receive a message from angels at the tomb. It says the women bow down uh, and the, the, uh, the angels have flashing clothing, which indicates clearly that they're angels. I think myself that this is Luke's way of showing us the recognition the women quickly came to have, but did not actually immediately have, but the recognition that they had actually uh, spoken with supernatural angels from God and the reverence they came to have for their experience, I think Luke has taken that recognition and reverence and moved it up into the tomb. <laughs> and we have seen, like in other, uh, we looked at other places in the Gospels where the evangelists have uh, seen their way free to do this. We saw that Matthew actually, you know, he backdated the withering of the fig tree. He even backdated the death of Jairus' daughter in order to compress the account about Jesus going uh, and uh, resurrecting the young uh, daughter of the synagogue uh, uh, ruler, Jairus. Um, there are other cases where this happened too. We saw that Luke has 
backdated the ascent the ascension of Jesus by uh, 39 days you know in the gospel account versus the account in Acts so it's not without precedent that he would do this and there was a certain point in doing that about the early belief of the women but if we were to look at uh, again at Mark and now John oh, what we see is that it seems that the women did not appreciate immediately that they did have an experience with supernatural angels so for example if you remember when we were in mark <clears throat> chapter 16 it says that they saw a young man uh, that was uh, sitting inside the tomb and the account does not make it uh, crystal clear that he is a supernatural angel. He's clearly a messenger because he gives the women a message, uh, but it's it's a little bit ambiguous, <coughs> excuse me, whether he is a supernatural messenger. And I think that's Mark's way of showing us that the women were somewhat uncertain. And we find that must have been the case because in John also, so if we look in John chapter 20, when Mary uh, comes to the tomb, sees that it's been disturbed, believes that Jesus' body has been moved. That's up in 20 chapters 1 and 2. And then in verse 11, it says, As Mary stoops and looks into the tomb, she sees two angels in white, sitting one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. They say to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She says, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, as I mentioned last time, the question, woman, why are you weeping, indicates a kind of objection. As that woman, you don't have a, a reason to weep, uh, which is uh, the, the gist of the message as we get it in, uh, in Mark, uh, Matthew, and Luke also. Uh, the message is Jesus has risen. You don't need to be grieving for him. So we just get a snippet of it here. Uh, woman, why do you weep? Woman, you don't have actually a reason to weep. However, Mary clearly doesn't seem to recognize that these are supernatural angels from God, or presumably she would uh, believe that something uh, good had happened, that they were communicating to her. And it says in verse 14, when she turned away from the tomb, she saw Jesus without recognizing him, somewhat like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus do not recognize Jesus in Luke. She says it does, she did not know that it was Jesus in chapter 14. And then in 15, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? So Mary has not stopped weeping <laughs> or, you know, she's uh, clearly still in a grieved and confused condition fearful of what has happened to Jesus's body, still thinking that his body has been moved, not comprehending that he has been risen, as I say. So it's the recognition will come to her that yes, she has had an experience with angels and yes, Jesus uh, uh, did uh, actually rise from the dead, but it, she's resistant to it. Uh, you know, at this point, it's um, she does not obey the implied command to stop weeping and grieving, just as in Mark. Um, as the women, it says, you know, Mary, and there it shows other women with her as uh, she flees from the tomb. In Mark, it says that uh, they're gripped with uh, astonishment and fear and trembling. It says, and they tell no one. Well, the angel had just told them, go and tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus would meet them in Galilee. It says the women tell no one. Now, it's momentary, but they're not intending to tell anyone, clearly because they have not yet come to the point of belief or understanding about what they have just experienced. Um, so there is... A disobedience in both cases a momentary disobedience not because of defiance obviously but simply because of doubt and a lack of understanding and confusion requiring Jesus to resolve the situation and we saw you know as I said in Mark 
it was clearly implied that in order for the disciples to get with the program and uh, eventually even go to Galilee as the instruction was given to the women to tell them, Jesus would have to intervene to overcome the doubt of the women and then the over, overcome the doubt of the male disciples. And so we get that in Mark and John. It's notable that as we progress in time, and I really think that we have strong evidence that uh, John was written later than the synoptics, uh, you know, uh, that, that there's a certain order of writing that can be discerned and John was the last to be written. We don't find the, uh, as it were, the faith of the disciples or the quickness of their response. We don't find that increasingly emphasized um, as we uh, move through the Gospels. We don't find them quicker and quicker to believe, except just in the case of the women in Matthew and Luke emphasizes their early belief. But here in, in John, we already see that John is still wanting to communicate that there was resistance and doubt to be overcome. Okay, so let's go back because I want to draw our attention to uh, something else before we move on. And this is back in verse 9 of chapter 20 in John. And it, it talks about uh, uh, Peter and the beloved disciple going to the tomb. Remember, the order is a little different. Because of Luke's uh, giving the women this early belief, um, the order of, go of uh, going to the tomb is after the women have delivered a message of faith. Uh, that happens, and John shows that it actually happened uh, prior to that point. But it says that after they, that is, after Peter and the other disciple see that the tomb is empty, but that the wrappings of uh, the, the, that the body had been wrapped in are still there. It says they understand that something remarkable has happened. They don't yet know really that Jesus has risen from the dead or under, understand that fully. So in verses 8, it says, so the other disciple, this is the beloved disciple, who had first come to the tomb, then also entered, and he saw and believed. He saw something re remarkable had happened. Um, but in verse 9, it says, For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And this is a little surprising for the reason that in the synoptics, we have Jesus telling the disciples on more than one occasion that the Son of Man will be killed and that he will rise from the dead after three days or on the third day, uh, depending which uh, account you're reading. That's in all of the synoptics. And specifically in the synoptics, they did not understand the saying of Jesus uh, when he told them this. And here it says at, at this point, and it's kind of at the 11th hour, it emphasizes they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So I want to uh, call to mind that in the fourth gospel, we find instance after instance when there's some item that we find in the synoptics and we get a, uh, I, I sometimes say a sideways version of it in John, we find it oblique or a different uh, presentation of the same idea, teaching, whatever it might be, in John versus the uh, synoptics. So uh, just to, to digress for a moment and give a couple of examples, so, um, and there are so many that we, we could do several studies just on this phenomenon. But uh, in the synoptics, we have Jesus, of course, at the Last Supper, giving the bread and wine to his disciples, saying, uh, eat and drink, this is my body, this is my blood of the covenant. The disciples do that. We don't have that in uh, John, when Jesus is with uh, the disciples for that final evening, and uh, there, it's clear that there's a meal going on, but we don't have the passing of the bread and the wine. But earlier in John, in chapter 6, after the feeding of the crowd, Jesus gives a discourse about the bread from heaven, and he says, unless you uh, 
uh, eat the Son of Man, uh, the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you'll have no life in yourselves. So there the idea comes out in a different setting. It's clearly the same idea that, uh, that, the, that bread and wine symbolizing his body and blood must be consumed. There's a sustaining of uh, those who uh, follow Jesus. There's a drawing of life from him that's represented by this eating and drinking act. So there, there's a case where we have that idea appearing in a different context in John. Clearly, it's the same idea. If you pursue that even just a little farther, <clears throat> excuse me, we would find that in the synoptics, during the Last Supper, when Jesus refers to the cup and the wine, he says, this fruit of the vine, or this product of the vine. And then he goes on to, uh, to pass it to them, saying, take, uh, this is my blood. Actually, in, in Mark's gospel, for, for example, first he passes it and says, this is my blood of the covenant. He says, no longer will I drink from this a fruit of the vine. Now, notice how this is working. Jesus says, this is my blood. Uh, uh, in Greek, it's actually, this is the blood of me, of the covenant. All right, the blood of me. Then he says, almost in the very next breath, or in the other synoptics, uh, one of them, it's in the previous breath, but... <laughs> But right next to that, he says, this is the fruit of the vine that is from the vine. So this is the blood of me. This is the fruit of the vine. What's the clear implication of that? That Jesus is himself figuratively the vine that, you know, that it's coming from. So in John, we have Jesus on that evening simply saying straight out without showing the cup and the, the bread being being present right there, we have Jesus simply saying to them, I am the true vine, <laughs> right? But this was the clear implication of his words in the synoptics. That's what I mean by uh, time and again, we get an oblique version of something from the synoptics, or you can look at the synoptics, it's an oblique version of something that's in John. Either way, there's a correspondence with it, but it appears a little a little differently, worded a different way, in, often in a different context. And that's the case here. They didn't understand the scripture that he would rise from the dead. Now, the first thing you might uh, uh, think of, um, just if you've been reading the Gospels quickly, is that, well, in John, Jesus never says to the disciples, in the Gospel of John, the Son of Man must be killed and then rise on the third day the way he does in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the synoptics. However, John in John, Jesus does say in chapter 10, he says that, that uh, as the good shepherd, he will lay down his life for the sheep and that he has the authority to lay it down and the authority to receive it back again. So, there, Jesus actually did indicate that he would die and rise from the dead. There's not the three-day time period, but the idea of death and resurrection is he's clearly indicating that. He had done that symbolically earlier in John when he talked about, uh, you know, uh, the confrontation in Jerusalem where he says, tear down this body, uh, the, this temple, uh, meaning his body, and I will raise it up in three days. So there's the three days occurring in a, in a symbolic version of the saying. But he says directly that he's going to lay down his life and take it back again. So we do have a version uh, in John of the saying uh, from the synoptics that the Son of Man would die and then rise again. But it says they didn't understand the scripture. And... There, there's a, a key point in this that the way the disciples came to understand how Jesus' actions and words fitted together in the purpose of God was by understanding how they were fulfilling Scripture. And you remember the, uh, Paul says that uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 that, uh, that he passed along a, a statement or a creed of faith saying that Jesus died 
according to the scriptures, rose on the third day according to the scriptures. And so the key to their understanding correctly and believing the statement that Jesus had, had given them about that he would have to be killed and then he would rise again on the third day, they would have to see that as a natural outworking of the messianic mission as contained in prophecy. And that th that would be the key to their seeing that the Messiah would have, this would, would be steps the Messiah would have to take in order to become Israel's true king, the savior of Israel and of the whole world and uh, of becoming the Lord of heaven and earth with uh, you know, power to save his people, to be the high priest, the great high priest. All of this would require these uh, steps as part of the messianic mission and that uh, they didn't understand that when he told them during his ministry. They didn't understand it right up to uh, you know, the, the time when Jesus was going to appear to them and show that he had been raised from the dead. So, uh, you know, John and the Synoptics simply throw light on each other in the way they present this. All right, so if you remember, we got down to, uh, in chapter 20, to where Jesus reveals himself to Mary, she recognizes him. Uh, we have a, a, a correspondence of this in Matthew, where the women leave the tomb and encounter Jesus almost immediately. Uh, this is uh, John's version of that encounter, uh, clearly. Um, and in verse 17, Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, verse 18, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. And in Matthew, it says the women go and tell the disciples. In Matthew, Jesus gives them the message, go and tell uh, the, uh, the apostles, the 11, that they will see me in Galilee. Here he says he's ascending to the Father. Well, uh, you know, how do those fit together? Well, there's a certain reason why uh, John wants to introduce this thought of Jesus ascending. But remember, we've seen before that all the crucial items are implied in Mark's gospel. Our, uh, I believe, earliest, our uh, sort of foundational gospel, that's another discussion that we'll have, how that works. Matthew was proper, properly our bridge to the Old Testament. Mark is kind of the first chronologically. In Mark, like all these other uh, critical items, the ascension of Jesus after he rises from the dead is necessitated, necessarily implied. As we go through, would, uh, if you remember, going through Mark's gospel, Jesus said things like, in Mark 8, he said, when the Son of Man comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels, indicating that there would be a transition to a heavenly uh, state because coming again, he would come in this heavenly glory. When he gets to the Olivet Discourse, it says they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Again, that indicates he's coming from heaven uh, at the end of the age. And then in verse, uh, in chapter 14, excuse me, of Mark, before the high priest, Jesus says you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. So how could he be coming from heaven after he rose from, you know, rises from the dead, as he said he would, unless there was an ascension, a transition back to a, you know, a sort of heavenly reserve of Jesus's bodily presence um, so that his uh, coming again at the end of the age would be one with heavenly glory from a heavenly uh, state uh, back into an earthly revelation of himself. And uh, uh, so Mark necessitates the ascension after the resurrection. All the other gospels, you know, follow suit. They have similar statements that Jesus had made. So, and in, in, in uh, um, 
uh, John, Jesus had been explicit earlier that he says, unless he went away to the Father, uh, he would not be able to send the Holy Spirit. So uh, all that material shows that an ascension would follow the resurrection. If Jesus is raised, he would be ascending. Uh, not necessarily immediately, because he needs to show himself his, to his disciples, make clear that he has risen and that they have a mission, that he, you know, there, there's a commissioning that he will do uh, for, uh, to send them out with the gospel message. So, even when Jesus tells the women to, to tell the apostles to go to Galilee where they will see him, that would be understood as a prelude to this ascension back to a heavenly state. Uh, any, anything that would happen in the meantime would have to culminate with his ascension. So, uh, so all of that is implied. It's stated plainly here. It's implicit in the other Gospels as well. And John has a particular reason for introducing or making plain or explicit that idea when we get to Jesus' appearance to uh, the remaining apostles, starting in verse 19. So we're going to just start into that, not get very far with it tonight. But it says, So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, so clearly we're located here, uh, same place as in Luke 24, where the, uh, the two disciples arrive who had seen Jesus on the road, to Emmaus, they arrive back. Uh, now we're, we're located, in effect, uh, coordinated with Luke at this point. Um, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Uh, again, we've got a similar scene to Luke. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. Remember in Luke, Jesus takes, uh, there's some statements, some consternation and uh, doubt on the part of the disciples. Jesus quickly convinces them by uh, showing them his, his palpable physical uh, state that he has. It says, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So here's the commissioning. Of course, we have it in Matthew 28 in Galilee, and it's back in Luke, again in Luke's 24th chapter later on. There is a commissioning of them. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. And Verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. That's to introduce the next scene or the next appearance. But notice this. There's a commissioning. It's brief, but it's obviously Jesus is empowering them to represent him spiritually and the message of forgiveness. There's also a message of uh, you know, judgment behind that forgiveness, <laughs> you know, if you retain the sins of any, that if they've been retained. Obviously, the gospel has a dividing effect. And it says, he said, breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. This is John's version of the Pentecost event. So in, in Acts, we get after 50 days after Passover, the disciples are gathered and there's a, a, a Pentecost outpouring and energizing by God's spirit. There's this witness to a crowd in Jerusalem. So we get sort of an, an elaborate scene of how this works to energize the church for bearing witness and beginning the mission that Jesus had given. And John has sort of moved up the essence of that event because he, he wants to include this, because he's not going to give a, a history of the, the uh, beginning of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, the purpose of the fourth evangelist is not to really cover that historical territory. Uh, 
except to make clear that this the spirit by which the church began its mission came from Jesus himself. And I believe that's why Jesus says, I am ascending. He's giving room here for an ascension of Jesus to the Father before this appearance. Now, it's not explicit, <laughs> but uh, you know, earlier in John, he said, if, unless I go to the Father, the Spirit cannot come. He needs to go to the Father to send the Spirit upon the disciples. So here he says, I'm ascending. Uh, then when he appears, he's had the opportunity to ascend so he can convey the Spirit by breathing upon them. The Spirit, you know, comes out in the, the breath and Spirit. There's a, uh, you know, a, a breath is a form of spirit and obviously it represents in, invisible act in, invisible entities activities you know there are many applications of the spirit that here it's the holy spirit that is coming out to empower the disciples now think about it in luke jesus said that they would receive power in acts jesus says wait for the holy spirit as Jesus is speaking and telling them that they will receive the Spirit, his breath is going out as he's speaking the promise of the Spirit. Now, if you go back into the Old Testament, you will find that when the prophet speaks, it can be, it's said to be a kind of enactment of what he is speaking. God says that Jeremiah will destroy and build by prophesying that destruction and rebuilding were going to occur it says he could be said figuratively to that that the destruction and the rebuilding are coming out in his words uh, that they're doing it. <laughs> you know um, it's just a way of, of emphasizing the closeness of the prophetic word and the fulfillment and so here you know, the, the, the earlier statements that we get in, in Luke, where Jesus promises the Spirit, can be looked upon as, an, as a conveying of the Spirit. And since John wants to compress all this, um, remember, compression is important. Luke compresses the ascension. He moves up the ascension. Well, John has really moved up the Pentecost event. The key item is the Spirit's coming from Jesus. It's coming because Jesus raised from the dead, is able to ascend to the Father and able to send the Spirit on the church. It's brilliantly wrapped up in this tight little package where chronology and order, you know, are just not so critical as the key ideas to communicate of what is happening. Oh, so our time is up and I've gone a little bit over time, so we'll end it there and go a little further uh, into uh, uh, the next appearance and the one after that. Thank you for joining me. May I'll be with me next time. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you that we've been able to look into your word. Please uh, keep us uh, safe in the power of your spirit. Um, equip us to do your will until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we'll see you again next time.